Today is going to be phenomenal. Week two of another, another level. Say another level. Come on, one more time. Another level. How many of y'all enjoyed last week? Come on, last week, another level. I pray that you applied the acronym we broke down. You're living a life of praise, repentance. You're asking and you're yielding and listening. If you did not attend last week, you can go to our YouTube channel and check it out. It's wild. I read a stat this week that was a little sobering and a little like, oh, They say that 20% of people in Americanized churches, uh, like Hope City, uh, only it's 20% attend every single week. The other 80% come once a month. Elbow the person next to you and say, are you the 20 or the 80? Come on, ask them. All right, every week, if you are new to Hope City or you call Hope City home, I like to have an anchor verse connected to the series. And here is the anchor verse today. It's James chapter one. We're gonna be reading verses two through four. It'll be on the screens. Dear brothers and sisters, that's all of us, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Like, whoa, wait, what? Because in the natural, that doesn't make sense. Because a lot of times we filter things through happiness. You, you can have happy moments, like you can get on a cruise in Galveston and be happy for a minute, and then you get seasick. You're like, where's my drama me? Where's the little sticker behind the ear? But joy, real joy, comes from God. So what he's saying is it's an opportunity for great joy because we also know as believers that Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord is our. So consider it an opportunity for great joy, for great strength. For you know that when your faith is tested, how many of y'all have gone through a testing season? How many of y'all are in a testing season? How many of y'all are not admitting you're in a testing season? Okay. (laughs) When your faith is tested, your endurance, this line right here is powerful, has a chance to grow. Verse four, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete Needing nothing. The sermon title for week two of another level, if you're taking down notes, is Divine Difficulty. Divine Difficulty. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you. We need them. Give us a mind sharp and ready to understand it. God, none of us want to just go through the motions. None of us just want to play church. We don't want to just check a box and say we did it. God, we need a heart ready to receive. So today we came in and we want to leave better than when we came in. If you receive it, shout amen. Come on. So there's so much about growing up. There's so many intricacies about growing up. And uh, Jackie and I have four amazing kids. Brecken's 14. My daughter Finley's 13. Don't look at me. She just turned 13. It breaks my heart. (laughs) Stay away from weird boys. I told her, I said, listen, the man one day I get to pick. He has to have a good credit score on all his teeth. Amen. (laughs) We have a seven-year-old named Daphne and a four-year-old named Fox, and so the pendulum swing is pretty wide. We got a 14-year-old dealing with 14-year-old stuff and a four-year-old who's just happy to be here. Like, if he's eating, he's like, hey, I'm just happy to be here. But growing up, we talk to them and have to talk to them about fitting in, and we talk to them about finding your place. I'm talking to my oldest son about, do you keep or shave that mustache? Amen. Boys cracking moments. How many of y'all remember those days? It's all a normal part of life. We go through difficulties and we go through growing seasons. And I love the interview that we had. How many of y'all enjoyed Pastors Ken and and Tabitha Clater? That was a part of a relationship series. There was one of the services, I don't know if it was the one we reposted, because honestly, as we're breaking down each service, there was these little Holy Spirit intuition moments that happen in each service. But one of the services, Pastor Ken talked about difficulties. Y'all remember that? He talked about how, hey, we all go through difficult seasons. We live in a fallen world. And when you know that you're gonna go through hardship and you're gonna deal with difficult seasons, you can expect it, not expect it like, here we go again, I'm gonna take another punch to the face. No, but he said, it's something that shouldn't catch you off guard because in John 16, 33, students of the Bible, you know this verse, Jesus himself said, you're going to go through things in life. Wave at me if you've gone through some things in life. And if you haven't, you haven't lived yet because you will. But Jesus said, listen, take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world. But I found as believers, specifically in our comfortable culture that we call Americanized Christianity, we have a lot of international friends as well, but we often think difficulties or testing moments is always an attack of the enemy. Like I grew up in churchy church where somebody coughed too much. We're like, he's got a demon. Let's cast it out. Like, no, I just got pollen. It's just the allergies. Like, (laughs) I'm gonna cast it out, my God. But we always blame it, maybe, or we say it's always connected to an attack from the enemy. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certainly instances, because 
The Bible talks about how the spirit realm is even more real than the natural realm. And I'm gonna unpack, we're gonna talk about warfare and spiritual warfare in another week because there are demonic strongholds and instances that we face, but there are also times that aren't connected to a demonic stronghold. And in my experience, and as I study the word for the past 23, 24 years, because I really got serious with my walk with the Lord in my late high school, early college years, we've we've talked about this, there are three things that I've seen, three types of trials we encounter. The first one is demonic attacks, spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual principalities and rules of the darkness. How many of y'all believe that there is strongholds of the enemy? Come on, it's okay. Awesome, some of y'all are like brand new to church, like my God, this has gotten real serious real quick. (laughs) The second thing I've seen, the type of struggles and trials is natural struggles. We live in a fallen world. We just go through some things. We just have some situations that happen. Sometimes they're because of our choices. And other things, it's just because it's just natural struggles. And the last one is divine difficulty. And that's the one we're gonna unpack a little bit more today. But as your pastor, I wanna challenge you today because it's so important to know the difference between these challenges and how to respond to them. Because chances are, we're running towards things we should be fleeing from, fleeing from things we should be enduring, and enduring things we should be pursuing. Because here's the truth, there's a real enemy who really doesn't like you. Some of you are like, okay, it's freaking me out a little bit, but it shouldn't, to be honest, because when you know the authority of who you are and whose you are, it, it, it empowers you to cling to Jesus more. So there is a real enemy that you should be aware of who really doesn't like you. And the closer you get to God, and the more you live open-handed, and the more you say your will, not mine, the enemy's like, okay, let me see if I can mess with her joy. Let me see if I can mess with his confidence because he recognizes that you're dangerous. How many of y'all believe there's healing in your hands? Come on, I, I talk about this a lot, but repetition is key. There's healing in your hands. Let me break this down. First Peter chapter five, you've heard us preach this. These next two verses, you're gonna, you're gonna know. Verses eight and nine. Be alert, another translation says stay alert, and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Elbow the person next to you and say, it's not gonna be me, come on, because I'm gonna outrun you, okay. (laughs) What's it say though? Resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know, this is key, that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Ephesians 6.10, we unpacked this in August during our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We called it the perfect fit, and it was the six pieces of the armor of God. Go back to our YouTube channel and watch the perfect fit. But we talked about this. It says, finally, this is a directive, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. How many of y'all are wearing the armor every day? Come on. How many of y'all have recognized when you're not wearing the armor, it just seems like there are things that just constantly are messing with your mind and you feel like you're taking on arrows from the enemy? Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's scheming, y'all. All the time, consistently, he's trying to poke the buttons of your life to try to mess with your morale, to try to derail your destiny. But here's some good news. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. Come on, say, my God is faithful. Come on, crowd participation. Say, my God God is faithful. faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So when it comes to demonic trials and attacks, we teach this all the time, we remind you constantly and consistently, put on the armor of God, stand in your position and authority, and recognize that you're covered and you're protected by God. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So we have to trust in Jesus We have to trust that he's our deliverer. We have to resist the devil. And then what will he do? The Bible says in James 4, 7, that when we, you, as daughters and sons of God, resist the devil, he will flee. Not walk away. Not taunt you on the way out. No, the Bible says he will flee. Have you ever seen somebody flee? They run real quick. We were in the Crocs store in Destin. Dude rolled up in there and grabbed six pair of Crocs and he fleed. And I went after him. I really did. I chased after him. I was like, you didn't buy those. <laughs> She's like, get back in the store. Come here. No, he wasn't like, I, <laughs> I got these. And, beep, 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 and the thing's going. No, he rolled out quick. The enemy says, I'm going to mess with her. I'm going to 
I'm gonna derail his destiny. I'm gonna get in his mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show him that he's not good enough. She's not smart enough. She's not pretty enough. He's not gonna ever be confident enough. And then we recognize who we are and whose we are. We resist the devil and it says that he will flee. Why? Because of the authority and the power of God that lives in you. And I love this part, the huge God who's standing with you. Come on, God has already worked it out. Come on, say, God has already worked it out. Everything I'm worried about. One more time, God has already worked it out. Everything I'm worried about. Come on, I need 500 people to give God praise. Come on, right now. So we have demonic struggles, but then we also have natural challenges. What does this look like? I think, again, something that we have started to misinterpret in today's culture, it's a culture of convenience. So when something is uncomfortable, we just avoid it. If something's uncomfortable, we're like, mm-mm. Maybe if I don't make eye contact with it, I can walk away. No, no, if something's uncomfortable, we just avoid it. We want abs without the gym. That's why I'm doing this new program called Sit and Be Fit. (laughs) Some of y'all are working out right now. (laughs) We want food without the farming. We want shipping without the waiting. Like, what's going on? I did the Prime now, I paid the membership. I ordered it, I blinked twice. Why isn't it right here? takes time. We want quality without the cost. We want health without the diet. Some of y'all are eating yellow number six and red 40 all the time. You're like, I don't know why I'm always on 10. Be like, because you are only eating gummy bears. Like, watch it. Because if it's difficult, if it's hard, we find ourselves in a cycle. I know I'm guilty of this, of falling back into a trap of an excuse where it's easier to just quit. That's why we challenge married couples and those walking through situations and those that are walking through storms. Hey, don't throw in the towel. Wake up again tomorrow. Get up, leave it in God's hands and everything you're worried about, he's already working out. And trust him even when you can't fully track him. The truth is working the soil in real life is required for a harvest. I come from a long line. A lot of them watch online. I come from a long line of farmers And our family and a lot of other families and businesses and companies depend on the 20,000 plus acres that my family farms every year. We do crops all throughout the Midwest. And I grew up in in watching my grandpa and my cousins and my uncles uh, stir up the ground, cultivate the ground and plant seed. And what ends up happening over time? They see a harvest. The truth is working the soil is required for a harvest, if you're trying to uh, gain uh, greater accolades in academics, like I got my, my bachelor's, I wanna get my master's, and I'm gonna move on to get my doctorate. Amazing. Years of school are required for the degree. There's things in life that are difficult and hard. There are also things in life that are just the facts of life. Pregnancy is hard. My wife carried four babies for nine months. Some of y'all are like, at the same time? Like, no, we'd have a show. We'd be on the Magnolia Network. Like, no, but pregnancy is hard. Come on, ladies, make some noise. It's true. Her body was working overtime like a mountain climber. Three in the morning, she's like, I need a pickle dipped in chocolate. I'm like, okay, I'll eat one with you. Like, let's, let's do this. This is getting wild. <laughs> this is getting crazy. Pregnancy is hard. Raising kids is hard. Come on, parents, make some noise. Your job can be difficult. It can be challenging. Friendships can be difficult and hard, especially high-maintenance ones. Don't look at the person next to you. Some of y'all are looking at me like blinking twice like. (laughs) High-maintenance for marriage is hard work. It's difficult. I need you to hear this. But just because something is difficult, just because something is hard, doesn't mean it's not worth it. We cannot fall in the trap. You can clap, it's okay. Because we can't fall in the trap of just saying, oh, this is tough, this is hard. I'm gonna bail on this situation. That's why it's so important to listen to the voice of God every day. So when the enemy or just life tries to make you throw in the towel prematurely because something gets too hard, you can rise up and recognize, no, just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not worth it. Because every single day, we, get, we wake up with an expectation. I know that we have a God that's bigger and stronger than the enemy standing against us. I know that. But I'm also self-aware enough to know we live in a fallen world. I'm also aware with expectation that Christ in me causes me to be an overcomer, but there's also stuff in life we deal with. Come on, one more time. Wave at me if life's been hard. Come on, we deal with difficult moments. But 
Sometimes it gets easier when you recognize I'm of this earth, I live on this planet, but I'm a king's kid. So I will endure some things, but I have a God who's standing with me. And some of y'all are like, okay, Pastor Daniel, so you're, let me understand this. You're, you're wanting me to wake up every day and just embrace that every day is gonna be hard. Now, it's gonna be challenging. I thought church was supposed to be encouraging. Like you're looking at the person next to you, like you invited me to this? Like, hey. <laughs> we should be encouraged. Why? Because again, we know in life's most difficult moments, I said it a moment ago, we have the presence of God who's present with us. And we have promises that we can hold on to. Here's one, so you don't think it's my opinion. Isaiah chapter 43, two says this. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers, here's the word, of difficulty, you will not drown. Some of you are like, I can't swim anyways. This verse is not. <laughs> when you walk through the fire of oppression, do not be burned. The flames will not consume you. We all go through things, but how many of y'all are grateful? We have a God who's present, and his presence is with us in the middle of every one of life's most difficult moments. Because the truth is, life has challenges and tests that we have to pass. My kids, we're dealing with it now. Pop quizzes and tests and things they didn't study for. And my daughter was like, what, is an F mean fantastic? I'm like, well, talk to your mom. Talk to your mom about this, because she is smarter than me. So uh, don't at me about this. I'm gonna get some DMs. I already got a text earlier. I blocked the guy. He's never allowed to text me again. Pastor Sean from Arcady campus. Because he didn't like this line. Michael Jordan is definitely hands down the goat. Amen. That's where you should have shouted a little bit better. It's not spiritual at all. But what's wild to me is that Michael Jordan didn't make his high school varsity basketball team his sophomore year. So much so that the coach told him, I don't know if you got what it takes. And they demoted him to JV. And he could have just thrown in the towel. He could have just said, you know what? I'm not good enough. Clearly, I don't have what it takes. I'm gonna take up soccer or pickleball. Pickleball didn't exist then. How many of y'all like pickleball? Come on, how many of y'all are into some pickleball? 43 of you, it's okay. If you have a pickleball group, email me. I might show up and wave and drive by. I'm excited about pickleball. Okay, if you don't know what it is, Google it. <laughs> it's amazing, okay. He could have thrown in the towel. He could have just said, you know what? This is the most frustrating, broken, hurtful, embarrassing moment. But no, 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 he got back up. It was a test and he worked hard. And the next year, he not only made varsity, but he ended up the leading scorer on his high school team. He went on from there to play for the University of North Carolina. And then he went on from there to become the greatest of all time. Come on, make some noise. Man, all you LeBron fans, this is ridiculous. There should be more noise. LeBron's top five, it's fine. Okay, moving on. I got the mic, you don't, I can say it. Okay, great. I remember at 17, my mom and dad were talking to me a lot about like, you're gonna have to go through some things because you're becoming a man. You become a strong, you're gonna deal with some stuff. And I told my parents, I said, I'm ready to buy my own car. And my mom and dad said, okay, what do you got? So I showed them, I said, like, I got some money that I can put down, I had a pretty significant down payment. I've been working super hard at a shoe store called Just For Feet. It was such a lie because they had clothes too. It wasn't just for feet at all, but and I was like, you guys, this is just false advertising. Anyways, save the money. My dad's like, I'm gonna take you to the dealership. What do you want? He was thinking I was wanting like a 97 Buick LeSabre. I said, no, sir. I want a 92 Pearl White Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4 with peanut butter leather. <laughs> Amen. And my mom's like, okay, praise God. So I walked in. They said, well, what kind of down payment do you have? And I told him, they said, oh, <laughs> your dad helping you? I said, no, it's my own cash, Okay. What I was naive to was that I had no clue that to finance a car like this, I also needed a good credit score. <laughs> and so they made me fill out an application. My mom and dad were like, you need to do it on your own. This is awesome. And the lady walked in and she said, hi. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened here. <laughs> we're gonna need to, uh, I think there was a glitch in the computer. And I said, really? She's like, yeah, something with your credit score. And I said, is it that good? She said, oh no, I've never. <laughs> I've never seen a score this low. I literally was thinking this had to be a, so let's rerun it. I was like, oh, but I've got, I've got enough cash down. And she's like, no, no, you need, to, you need to have a credit score to back. So we need to look at your history and we need to look at your finances and we need to look at everything. 
And y'all, I remember just sitting there and my dad leaned over and said, I got you. And my dad co-signed for that car. Come on, somebody. Thank God for a dad, a good, good father has stepped in. We all go through hills and valley moments. I had to pass the test. And you know what ended up happening? It sparked something in me to be a better steward of my money. All throughout the last 25 years, I've wanted to maintain a a better uh, credit score. Some of you are like, this is for me, but it's also stepping on my toes a little bit. (laughs) I've been a better manager of our funds, debt to income ratio, to make sure that that credit score wasn't funny. That my money didn't end up uh, uh, be, being, ha, have a lid put on it. So I learned that in that season, but I'm also grateful that my dad stepped in. So we have difficult moments. We go through testing season. We go through natural difficulties. But the thing I really want to unpack for the next 24 minutes is I want to talk about divine difficulties because this is the spiritual work that's required to reap a harvest of righteousness. It's the tilling of a spiritual soil required to reap a spiritual harvest. For some of you, you're like, wait a minute, cross your arms. You're like, that sounds a little legalistic. That sounds like legalism. Here's the truth. Jesus paid it all. He did. And as Christians, we believe that our salvation isn't earned. How many of y'all are grateful you didn't get what you deserved? Come on. I I am. Our eternal security is simply the result of Jesus spilling his blood on the cross, covering all of our shame, our iniquities, and all of our struggles, even our compartmentalized sins. And that one time of sacrifice paid for us on the cross, it fixed and healed all the struggles that we have, and it also bridged a gap so that we could have connection and communion with him. But there's also a spiritual law that oftentimes parallels the natural processes that we see all around us here on this earth. And that law is this, that there is, a, there is often a divine testing that is given to us for the full blessing of God to be unlocked in our lives. Again, it's not legalism, it's actually God's kindness. I think of it this way. When a bank checks your finances and your financial situation for a home loan, they're testing it and looking at it and looking into it for both you, but also their safety. Because if they give you a loan premature and you can't afford it, then you could end up losing that home, become disappointed in the process, and it makes things way worse than if they would have just said no. When you get a driver's license, there's a test. How many of y'all are grateful that you can do multiple driving tests over and over because it took you four or five times, amen. I literally can't back the stat statistically, but I believe that 83% of Houstonians never pass the driving test. (laughs) Y'all are out on these streets with me. It gets wild out here. But no, the driving test is so that they can see if you're able to operate within the freedom of driving around and traveling that's being entrusted to you. How many of y'all drive on that HOB solo? <laughs> How many of y'all have contemplated propping up your Labradoodle and putting a hat on it? <laughs> okay, that's enough. What if I said this today? What if I said, hey, I wanna bless you with a business? Some of y'all are like, is that a prophecy? No, just listen. Maybe there's a business that I'm like, hey, I wanna bless you in this area of passion or expertise. What would you do with it? Well, first you'd have to establish Uh, business hours. You yourself would have to lead by example and show up on time. You have to hire some employees, set up some intentional marketing, keep really good records. All of that sounds like hard work. Every day you would sort of feel like it's a test, but your faithfulness in managing the business, if you ran it with integrity and you're a person of honesty and dedication and great character, all that hard work would pay off And at some point, because you found your rhythm and your cadence, you would live in a harvest season. God often tests us this way. He provides the directive. I mean, I'm grateful for the direction from the Lord. Come on. He'll even give you the desire, that passion in your heart. He'll even set that plan in motion. But then he requires for you to show up. That's big, because that's a choice. He even tells us how to show up, because the game plan's not a mystery. But again, there is a test. And that is this, how will you steward, this is what God is asking us in the word, how will you steward what I gave you? Would you do it your way? Will you just choose and pick and choose because of your human strength and your ability and because you bet on you? Would you steward it your way, cut corners perhaps, lack some integrity here and there so you can climb the corporate ladder and get some selfish gain? Or will you live open-handed and say, God, because this all belongs to you, my time 
my talent and my resources, my, my money, it all belongs to you anyway, so I don't wanna do it my way, I wanna do it your way. So if you're taking down notes, write this down. His best often involves a test. Oof, we don't like it. How many of y'all like tests? You're like, oh, I love them. I just, ooh, pre-calculus, yes, Lord. Give it to me, I love this. As believers, maybe you've heard this before, Pastor Brandon said it. I've been saying it all throughout this message. Everything belongs to God. Do y'all believe that? You woke up again and you're breathing. Do you think that breath belongs to you? Well, it's my breath. Yeah, because you didn't brush your teeth. It's your breath. <laughs> if you refuse to mouthwash, it's your breath. Amen. Get your breath. Oof. But no, it all belongs to him. We woke up. We're breathing again today. Genesis 127 talks about how you are knit together. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. The intricacies of how he designed you. Ooh, I love it. And God has a sense of humor. Just walk around the mall and look at people. It's fun. (laughs) Somebody called us the beauty and the beast the other day, and I was like, which one am I? (laughs) And they were like, you know. Here's the truth. God knows what we need, and he has a storehouse, and he can give us anything that he sees fit. And every good thing in life comes from him. But his best oftentimes involves a test. And what's the test? Y'all are gonna get this. It is the test of alignment. The assignment starts with him. The alignment starts with us. He's looking at what will you decide to align yourself with? Your circumstances? Or will you align your life with his heart? Will you align your life through life of great faith. In Genesis 6, we see this Bible hero named Noah. Everybody knows this story. I preached on this. I love that he was a righteous man. And God said, Noah, I can choose you in this land of wickedness because of your character, because of your integrity, because of your honesty. God overwhelmed him with his kindness. And God placed in front of him an opportunity and said this, I want you to gather your family. I want you to build a boat and repopulate the earth. It's like, whoa, okay, that's a lot. In that time, this is key, there was no such, nobody knew what rain was. The word rain didn't exist. If you're a student of the Bible, you'll see in those days before the flood, uh, rain, the the earth watered from the ground up. That's how things were fruitful and multiplied in the earth. It didn't rain. So talking about floods was crazy. Like, I'm gonna build a big boat. They're like, what? Because it's gonna rain. You're like, is he talking crazy? What is he talking about? And everything's gonna flood. But because of Noah's obedience and his test of alignment, and he pursued God's best in the midst of the taunting and the mocking and the confusion of the scope of work, Noah chose diligence. He endured, and he chose to align his life with God's instruction. Y'all, the ark's dimension, this is wild. You can Google this. It says it was around 550 feet long. Like, that's a big yes. Like, yes, God, I'll do this. It was 91 feet wide and 55 feet high. Walking out those steps of obedience had to be difficult, but Noah recognized it was a divine difficulty. How many of y'all feel like you've gone through seasons that were a divine difficulty? You knew God was like, let me test him in this. Let me test her in this and see if she'll or he will be faithful in the small. Because if you can be faithful in the small, God can bless you with so much more. Hear me on this. If God's given you a dream from him that's his will, he will, he will also, this is key, he intends to resource it. If it's a God-sized dream that he's placed in your life, in your heart, that's his will. Some of you are like, I have a huge idea. It's called Bibleopoly. It's a monopoly, but it's all about the Bible. They already have that. It's already out. Okay. But your success, watch this, oftentimes the success of this dream coming to, 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 come to flourishing is this, it's found in your alignment. It's found in your connection to God because here's the truth, in the word we see that God wants to pour out his spirit. We see that God wants to place favor and great grace on us. He wants to bless your business, your finances, your dreams, your desires, but the blessing is oftentimes unlocked through your obedience. And I've said this so many times. I've seen y'all repost this. Obedience isn't always fun, but it is always fruitful. And when you align your life to him and say, okay, God, I get out of the way. I'll trust you even when I can't track you. I know that you are big enough and strong enough and you'll provide all of it. There's a verse in Malachi chapter three, verse 10. Now we're a church that believes in the tithe. We're a church that believes in generosity. 
We're a church that shows up and serves a community and we reach people far from God. But this is what it says, bring, it's a directive, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That means the local church. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this. This is the only scripture where God says, test me in this. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you don't have room enough to store it. Y'all, God has a storehouse. And from it, he desires to pour out abundance and increase. Y'all hear me on this. God wants to bless you. Some of y'all are like, I hear you, Pastor Daniel, but I'm just not that lucky. You don't need luck when you have God's favor. When the favor of God is on your life and great grace is on your life, you don't need luck. And here's the truth. Your blessing isn't on back order. <laughs> your blessing is, is, is ready to be unlocked and brought down into your life. R raise your hand up if you say, I want so much blessing, I don't have room enough to take it. Come on, I don't, I, don't have, I don't have room enough to contain it. That's everybody. Everybody wants that. All right, so I'm gonna give you some real stats and real facts that should honestly be a little sobering. It should be a little, uh, I didn't realize that. This is the truth. Across Americanized churches, only about 20% of people actually consistently give in the local church. 20% of people fund it. The rest of us are like, I'm just glad who paid for the coffee. I don't care, it's good, <laughs> amen. Only 20%. Here's a more sobering stat. Out of the 20%, only three to 5% actually tithe in the local church. Because there's this misconception that God's trying to get something from you. Maybe you grew up in churchy church where the offering moment was 45 premium minutes. And they were like, there's seven of you right over here gonna give $1,000. You're like, why did I sit in the $1,000 section? I thought I was in the $5 section where well, they switch it up. They move it around. That's okay. But here's what I want you to hear. We gave away over $1.4 million last year to local, national, and global missions. We've given away over $9 million to local, national, global missions. And that's amazing. We've done all of that on the consistency of about 20% of people giving. How much more impact can we make? I'm telling you, how much more impact can we make if all of us did something? If all of us said, and, and, he, and the Lord said, test me in this. I remember when Jackie and I's money was really, really funny. And we were like, I don't know if I can do this. There's not enough margin in our lives to be able to give at this level. But what we don't see is on the other side of your obedience is abundance and a new opportunity and a business and a promotion and increase. That goes with your time. That goes with your talent. How many of y'all are sitting on the sidelines wondering if there's room for you? The answer is yes. There was a girl, 13 years old, in between services, talking to Pastor Jackie and I, and she said, I have a gift of music. I play two different instruments, and she was talking about all of us. I said, that's amazing. So I introduced her to Mariah, who's uh, our worship uh, director out in our youth. I said, I wanna bridge this gap, because I loved her step of faith that says, hey, I wanna be willing with my time. I wanna be willing with my talent. At 13, some of y'all are 53, and you're like, my God. But what are you doing with what God has entrusted you with? Because here it is again, it all belongs to him. I remember when 10% was a stretch. And I'm just being really transparent. It's the only way I can lead. I remember when 10% was a stretch. We didn't know how we were gonna do it. And God showed up and breathed and we were able to do it. And then we said, I wonder if we could now above that 10% give a little bit more. And I look back now on all the years of God's faithfulness through our step of obedience when we align our lives to him, there has been an outpouring of his spirit. It's not always monetary. There was a gentleman that talked to Pastor Brandon and said, I started tithing. I said, I'll test God in this. He said, I did it for three months. And he said, you know what's amazing? I look around and all my family comes to church with me now. The greatest desire of my heart was to see them with me. And I believe it was unlocked through my obedience. Some of y'all are looking at me like, come on, I don't know about all this. No, it's true. This is Bible. It's not legalistic. It's old covenant and new covenant. What could we do to make an impact if we all did something with our time, our talent, and our giving? Here's some amazing stats. 3,289 people have committed their lives to Jesus just this year in our services across our campuses. That's a lot of people. Y'all should shout. 3,289 people. We have served 675,000 645 meals because of generosity through the 20% and people that have said, I want to serve. You should shout, 675,000. 
This is amazing. 12,931 salvations have happened in our prison ministry. That's phenomenal. So let me, let, me, let me paint this picture for you. If God hung the stars in the sky, which we know he did, he formed the entire earth, which he, we know he did, placed it in the perfect distance from the sun, can he not place you in the perfect distance from promotion? Woo. Can he not place you in a room with a person that could bring investment and has the power to invest into a company or a dream or desire? This is the God we serve. Can he not place you near a friend that becomes maybe your spouse for life. That's why people are serving, like, oh, I see, okay. <laughs> Come on, single people. Get on the team and serve, okay? Your serving is connected to your, to your spouse, maybe. <laughs> but God's big enough. If he hung the stars in the sky, you don't think he can, mom and dad, place your son or daughter in our kids' ministry or youth ministry near a friend that you've been believing God for your kid to have? Some of y'all are looking for community. You're believing God for friendships. But when's the last time you've joined or been a part of a group? Get off the sidelines and serve. Make some noise, Dream Team. Come on, we've got hundreds of people that serve every week. And it's not just about being doers. We're a family. Showing up with Krispy Kreme and coffees. Amen. Like that's something we're like, I'm signing up today. My God. Didn't realize. <laughs> God wants to align you with his resource but he needs you to align yourself, it's a choice, to his heart. Because biblical character and integrity and obedience is necessary for promotion in our lives. Number two, write this down. Maybe this is a hard pill to swallow and maybe you're like, ah, this is tough. Because my time, my talent, my treasure, this whole thing belonging to God, 10%, radical generosity, serving, that's a lot. Here's the truth, number two, there's help when life gets hard. When you just don't know what to do and where to turn and how to fix it and how to resolve it, there is help <laughs> when life gets hard. John 14, 26 says it this way, but the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf, will teach you all things. Say all things. It will help you remember everything that I've told you. I love that. Anybody into, this is kind of an interesting uh, ask. Anybody into rally racing? This guy over here, I appreciate that. And this dude right here in the middle. Strong beard, my friend. Okay. I, I didn't know anything about rally racing to the degree of this, but my friend Josh is on our team. He's like, PD, do you know about rally racing? We started talking about it. There's this driver and he has a friend slash a man or a woman who's a spotter. A driver who's driving excessive speeds and somebody called a spotter. Check out this video. This is what rally racing looks like. The guy with the diary is telling him what to do. Titans four. Titans four. 120. Let me break this down. You got a driver driving ridiculous speeds and you got a guy with a journal <laughs> saying at 30 feet, we'll make a right. Like it's crazy. You have a driver and a spotter. The spotter though knows how to approach the difficult parts of the track. Why? Because he has spent time studying the entire course. They said they, they walk it, they, they measure it, they drive it, they drive it in slow speeds and high speeds. He has studied how to make the difficult decisions in the moment. He has studied the entire course to keep them from ending up in a crash. The driver though, this is key, the success of the team, the success of the driver is dependent on his ability to, ready? To listen. Y'all, the Holy Spirit, God our Father, is so much more than a spotter. And I love this analogy because Proverbs 16, nine says in their hearts, humans determine their course. We're out here rolling but it's the Holy Spirit, it's the power of God's presence that establishes our steps. Oftentimes the driver and the spotter will wear, they'll wear headphones to make sure that their connection because of the noise of the engine and the noise of the road doesn't get lost in translation because one decision, one mistake by the spotter can cause the driver and him to end up in a rut. Maybe you feel blindsided. 
Maybe you have struggled with control issues. Why? Because you've been pushing away and pushing out the one who is to navigate all things in your life. Y'all, his way is so much better. I, 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 don't, I don't like the, uh, my co-pilot's Jesus. Now, he should be in charge, for starters. But I love that analogy because the Holy Spirit is not just a spotter. He's actually our friend. And this is great news because it's not just a professional relationship like the driver and the spotter. No, it's a relationship. It's a friendship. The Holy Spirit cares for you personally. He cares about your provision, your health, your wholeness. He cares about your peace. That's why he's the comforter. That's why he's the helper. There's this old hymn that says, what a friend we have in Jesus. Y'all remember that song? What a friend we have in Jesus. You know the thing about it is I realized yesterday when I was singing that song that uh, our median age is way younger. So I said, Edwin and Byron, would you come out here and would you play a song that maybe some of us do know from the classic Toy Story soundtrack? You've got a friend in me. If you know, would you sing along? Come on, say, you've got a friend in me. That's pretty good. Say, you've got a friend in me. When the road gets rough ahead and you're miles and you're miles from your nice warm bed, yeah. Just remember what your old pal said, yeah. You've got a friend in me. Come on, y'all. Say, say, you. Come on, one more time. You sound good. Say, you got a friend in me. Yeah, that was pretty good. Did you just play the Full House soundtrack at the end? Give it up for Edwin and Byron. That was amazing. And give it up for yourselves. You just auditioned for the Christmas choir. 20% of you made it. Okay. Why did you sing that song? Because the Holy Spirit is our friend. And when the road looks rough ahead, he's got your back. He's on your side. He's the one saying, don't go left, go right. We have to do what the driver was doing, and we have to simply listen. Stop pushing him out. Pull him closer. I love that Jesus is just one mention of his name away. In Genesis, it said that Moses was considered a friend of God. Yes, he's our father. He's our provider. He's our protector. But he's also a personal God who sees the intricacies of your life, has never missed one tear that's fallen on your pillow, has never missed one prayer that has been prayed. He hears, sees, knows you, and loves you, and he's chosen you. Maybe you've pushed him away. Maybe you feel too far down the wrong track. Maybe you found yourself in a rut. I love this. This is really, really good news. Number three, write this down. You still get a redo. How many of y'all are grateful for the redo? Come on, Isaiah 40 verse 31 talks about how we can have, we have access to new strength, but we also have access to renewed power. Reset, restart, begin again. That's what renew means. We get a redo. Not one or two or three, but how many of y'all are grateful there's enough grace for all of your goof-ups? So somebody should be shouting and running around the building. Like, no, we get to read you. I love this scripture. Peter approaches Jesus and asks, because, you know, he himself is a little puffed up and all these people have sinned against him. So he says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. In this moment and in this culture, what Jesus was saying is you gotta just keep forgiving. He's issuing a radical command to Peter to forgive without limits. But he was also modeling to Peter that he and God himself forgives us. Come on, one more time. How many of y'all grateful for a God that has poured out mercy for all of our mistakes and struggles? <laughs> David, a man who needed great grace, as we do as well, had all kinds of struggles. And he wrote this in Psalms 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. Not like I'm afraid of him, but reverence and honor. Sovereignty, because he's a sovereign God. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions or our sins from us. As our Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Hear me on this church, you still get a redo. Another chance to bow your heart, to bow your head, to align your life to his, to take a knee in his presence and say, God, I can't do this on my own. With every eye closed just for a moment, if today you would say, Pastor Daniel, I felt, 
I felt convicted because the truth is I'm not fully in alignment with God's will for my life. Pastor Daniel, I've been convicted that I've strayed away from his path of purpose for my life. And I want you to hear me say, don't continue on the path you're on and behave your way out of blessing. Because the truth is there is free will. You don't have to align your life with God. You don't have to accept the redo and you can continue to just try to survive on your own. You can hoard your time, your talent, your treasures and hope that life makes sense. But there's a directive from God to trust him, to seek his plan, to tune your ear to his voice, to tune your ear and your attention to his voice, to cast off anything that seeks to destroy or distract you from his will. And then he's empowering us to stand tall to stand brave, to wear the armor of God, Ephesians 6, and to know that your Father is covering you. Your Father wants to pour out favor and blessings on your life. He wants to overshadow you and have great grace rest upon you. And if you would say today, Pastor Daniel, the truth is, I have I've disconnected from my alignment with him, but I wanna realign with him today with every eye closed across every campus. Here's my ask. This is not a salvation moment. This is a humanity moment between just God and you as a daughter to a dad, a father to a son. If you would say, the truth is, Pastor Daniel, I have not been aligned to his, his will. I, I haven't been stepping into the responsibility that he's entrusted me with. I haven't been stewarding what he's asked me to be a good steward of. I've been doing things in my own strength, based upon my own circumstances and not relying with great faith on him. Maybe today you felt a stirring that says, I wanna take the next step and I wanna tithe. I wanna take the next step and be more generous. I wanna take the next step and actually step out of my comfort zone and serve and be a part of what God's doing here. I wanna step out of my comfort zone and not make everything about me, myself, and I, but see others and look at the filter that God sees others through. Today, I wanna to align my heart to God in a deeper way. If that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I wanna align my heart in a deeper way. Amazing, 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 amazing. And your next step is to simply step through the door and do it. Nobody can make you align your life to the heart of God, but today's the day. You say, today, I, I have felt tested. You can put your hands down. And I always just say, well, that's the devil. Maybe it's a natural circumstance or struggle because of something you've done, or maybe it wasn't at the hands of something you've done. It's just because we live in a fallen world. Or maybe today, the words divine difficulty resonated in your heart. Ah, I've been in a testing. Let me just say this. The pruning season is never comfortable. I've got good news and bad news. I said this last week. You're growing, and it's really uncomfortable. That's the good news. The bad news is you're growing, and it's really uncomfortable. The pruning season is never fun. We're walking through the growing pains of my boy going from a little boy to probably gonna be about six, seven the way he's growing right now. Oh man, I hurt. That's called growing pains. It's the same way. Your relationship with God and the testing, the divine difficulty moments. Ooh, it's uncomfortable. You're growing, but it's uncomfortable and that's okay. The pruning season is uncomfortable, but what comes after the pruning is a blooming, beautiful wellspring of God's faithfulness in your life. All right, next opportunity. I got two invitations, and then we're gonna wrap. The first one is, Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I'm gonna count to three in just a moment. We will not embarrass you. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. I'm gonna commit my life to Jesus today. I want to align my heart through salvation. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse nine and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's it. He's already paid the price. The tab has been paid in full. All you have to do is surrender. Maybe you're the second invitation. And you would say, yeah, this whole divine difficulty thing. No, I've opened a lot of doors up in the natural and the enemy. The devil's been attacking me because I've fallen away from God, but I want to rededicate my life today. I know better. Maybe you felt like God has been mad at you, but hear me, he's not mad at you. He'll open his arms and embrace you as a daughter and son again. He's just one mention of his name away. You can unlock blessing again and favor again and take the lid off of your life. Sure, you're gonna still walk through some divine difficulties, 
But man, it's better to do it with the presence of God because he's present with you. So one, I want to give my life to Jesus. Two, I want to rededicate my life. If you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. But if you're in any of our campuses, additional seating, three, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see you and you and you. I saw you and you. I see all of you. I see you and you. I see you, my friend. I see you, my friend. I see you all the way in the back. Let's go. Incredible. I see you, my friend, over here. Amazing. I saw you over there. I saw you waving over here and here. Come on, Hope City, a little bit more. There was a bunch of people, like 17 or 18, that said, today's my day. Just here at West Houston. 15 just last night. With every eye closed, pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today, everything changes because I'm going to start living wholeheartedly for you because doing it in my own strength is just not working. I'm asking for forgiveness for all my sin. Here's all my shame. Here's all my struggles. I repent now, and I'm grateful that you're covering it all. Thank you, Jesus, for hanging on that cross, for exchanging your life for mine so that I can live a life of freedom. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise for everybody who just said, today's my day. 